Did you know that some 60 million years ago, a giant snake measuring over 14 meters long roamed the Earth's surface? The history of the Earth is a huge book filled with chapters of calm, storm and twists and turns. In this story, life has colonized all terrestrial environments. Its traces can be found on every continent, from the highest peaks to the abysses. Biodiversity is constantly evolving. This evolutionary mechanism is based on the genetic variability of individuals within populations and manifests itself under the constraints imposed by the conditions of the environment in which the individuals live. This is how certain lizards evolved into snakes and how these same snakes, which were originally relatively modest in size, ended up being more than 10 meters or more than 30 miles long before disappearing. The adventure of the first snakes began during the Mesozoic era. This period of geological time is marked by two major biological crises. It began 251 million years ago, in the wake of the Permian extinction and ended 65.5 million years ago with a new catastrophe that triggered a mass extinction. The Mesozoic lasted more than 185 million years. One of the main features of this period is that Pangaea, the supercontinent of the time, splits, creating the opening of the Atlantic Ocean. The result was intense volcanic activity in oceanic ripples and hotspots. Carbon dioxide accumulates in the atmosphere, creating a strong greenhouse effect. The weather is warm. These pleasant conditions make the Mesozoic a particularly propitious period for the development of life. Reptiles developed and diversified in an extraordinary way, including marine reptiles, the first dinosaurs and flying reptiles. It is thanks to them that the Mesozoic has been called the Age of Reptiles. Nevertheless, other species are also making their presence felt. Birds and mammals are making their appearance. In the ocean, cephalopod mollusks such as belemnites and ammonites dominate the waters. Flora too thrived in this almost tropical atmosphere, undergoing considerable diversification with gymnosperms and then angiosperms, the flowering plants that gradually supplanted them at the end of the Mesozoic. The category of snakes that interests us here is the one that took pride of place in the animal kingdom during the Mesozoic. Alongside the evolution of dinosaurs, snakes sometimes seem to have been overlooked, wrongly so. And yet, they demonstrated a real capacity to adapt to their environment and an incredible evolution. So incredible, in fact, that some of them even reached considerable heights up to 14 meters or 46 feet in length. If snakes are an animal that arouses fascination, but also fear today, emotions would have been even more intense if we had crossed paths with these giant snakes, whose most famous representative is Titanoboa. How did these snakes evolve from their reptilian ancestors? How did they develop the morphological attributes that so characterize them? And how did they reach the exceptional sizes that categorize them as giants? Dear Traveler, welcome. Today we're setting off on a new temporal adventure to discover the golden age of giant snakes. 
But before we explore the farthest reaches of the past for a new venture, remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss a thing. Thank you and have a great trip. For the general public, snakes are simply cold-blooded legless animals. They are often associated with venom. And yet, they are fascinating because of their particularities and diversity. These reptiles are characterized in particular by the considerable elongation of their bodies, which are uniform along the vertebrae and ribs, and by the absence of limbs. Their skin is far from ordinary, with horny scales. Snakes also have eyeglasses, so their eyelids are fused and transparent. They are formidable predators. Snakes didn't always have the morphology we know today, but here is the story of these unusual animals. Snakes are reptiles. Their origins can be traced back to their history. This began towards the end of the primary era, around 340 million years ago, and developed during the secondary era, when many groups became extinct. While giant reptiles such as the famous dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and plesiosaurs did not survive, snakes did. In fact, they are a true evolutionary success story, numbering some 3,500 species today. By comparison, crocodilians number around 20 and turtles around 350. They have conquered the most varied environments, including deserts, marine environments, forests, and all continents except Antarctica. Their shape and their locomotor and dietary adaptations make snakes highly specialized reptiles. Could this success be due to the loss of their limbs, which gives them a considerable advantage by enabling them to move around in many different environments? Perhaps, but not only. The evolution of their skull skeleton has enabled them to capture very large prey, and the acquisition of a venomous apparatus is a significant advantage. It is undoubtedly in all these improvements that we find the reason for their evolutionary success. One of the oldest fossils attributable to reptiles dates back over 300 million years. This small animal, some 20 centimeters long, is depicted with a massive anapsid-type skull, found today in turtles. Anapsids gave rise to two main groups, synapsids and diapsids. The synapsids later became mammals. Among the diapsids are the ancestors of snakes. The oldest known diapsid dates back some 300 million years. Petrolocosaurus cansensis measures 40 centimeters or 16 inches. It is certainly terrestrial and insectivorous. This little lizard lived at the end of the Carboniferous period, when the planet's atmosphere was rich in oxygen. Forests were lush and predators were giants. He feeds on the small insects they unearth in the vegetation, but he himself is prey. He is to contend with predators such as Meganura, a giant dragonfly, measuring one meter or three feet in length, and 70 centimeters or 28 inches in wingspan. The Eurypterida, a kind of giant scorpion that could reach up to two meters or 6.6 .6 feet in length for the largest specimens. The diapsids subsequently divided into two major groups, the archosaurs, 
and the Lipidosauromorphs. The first group includes dinosaurs and pterosaurs. Today, only crocodiles and birds, descendants of certain dinosaurs, remain. Lepidosauromorphs include pliosaurs, ichthyosaurs, and other placosaurs, which are aquatic animals, as well as lepidosaurians with sphenodontids, lizards, amphisbeans, and snakes. These last three groups are the most closely related animals and make up the squamates. Lizard morphology is highly varied. There are lizards with four legs and a long tail, and others with elongated, legless bodies. What all lizards have in common is that they have lost the lower temporal arch of their skull. Even burrowing species lack both arches. Amphisbeans are snake-like burrowing animals. They have a ringed appearance thanks to skin furrows and resemble large earthworms. With the exception of one species, amphisbeans have no trace of limbs or temporal arches. Snakes have lost both arches, have very elongated bodies, and are limbless. Their eyes have no mobile eyelids. Unlike amphisbeans, snakes are not ringed on the outside, but rather resemble a potted lizards. Snakes originate from the lizard amphisbean family. Some groups of squamates are thought to be close relatives or ancestors of snakes. Since snakes have been found in fossil form for millions of years, their ancestry is not to be found in any current squamate group. The challenge is to find the group that shares the same fossil ancestor with snakes. Amphisbeans have been suggested as the closest relatives of snakes among serpentiform squamates. However, due to extremely complex anatomical specializations, herpetologists have refuted this hypothesis. Among the groups of lizards that possess limbs, two groups have been suggested as possible ancestors of snakes, the Varanoids and the Skinchomorphs. Among the Varanoids are the monitor lizards, the Heliderms, which are venomous lizards, and a very rare lizard called Lanthanotus, which lives in Sarawak on the island of Borneo. Their morphological characteristics, such as the structure of the skull, tongue, and mandible, as well as the type of tooth replacement, suggest that they may be directly related to snakes. What's more, they include entirely fossilized groups. Late Cretaceous mosasaurids are large marine varanoids, reaching up to 10 meters or 33 feet in length. Their limbs were transformed into fins, like those of dolphins. Dolichosaurids and Igelosaurids, also Cretaceous marine varanoids, are also suggested to be close to the origin of snakes. All these animals have well-developed legs in common, which differs from snakes, but other Cretaceous marine fossils have led to the discovery of clearly serpentiform organisms. These include Pachyophis and Pachyrachis, which are more or less intermediate between varanoids and snakes. Some scientists even classify them in the latter group. Pachyophis is a genus of snake that existed at the end of the Cretaceous. It belongs to the Cymeliophidae family. The Cymeliophidae family is characterized by hind limbs and a pelvic girdle. 
Pachyophis is about a meter long, with a flattened morphology, and Pachyostosis, a non-pathological condition characterized by thickening of the bones. Its skull is thin and pointed. Its jaw bones are more reminiscent of lizards than snakes. Conversely, Pachyophis's teeth are obviously snake-like. They are inserted into a bull, like alveoli, buried in the jawbone, and are present over the entire jaw. The presence of backward-pointing teeth indicates a carnivorous diet and a prehensile rather than biting action. Its jaw structure enables it to grasp and swallow at the same time. It feeds on soft, rather small and slippery foods, such as marine worms. The specimen's vertebral articulation is very similar to that of a snake, but the construction of the vertebrae themselves diverges. Pachyophis lives in shallow aquatic marine regions. It moves by undulating horizontal movements of its body. Its neck is more flexible, indicating that it can perform vertical movements, such as holding its head above its flat stature, a common posture for an animal living in shallow water. Pachyrhachis is a genus of snakes with well-developed hind limbs, including a hip, knee, and ankle joint. It is a surprising mixture of snake and lizard features, although its status as an ancient snake has been confirmed. The skull of Pachyrhachis displays most of the features derived from modern snakes. Its body is slender and elongated. It was a slow swimmer, and therefore an ambush rather than a pursuit predator. Its narrow head and neck enable it to reduce water resistance, but also to feed in burrows or narrow crevices. Other contenders for the title of snake ancestor are the skinkomorphs. They include a large number of tetrapod lizards, but also some snake-like species, some herpetologists have speculated that they may share a common ancestor with snakes, since the structure of the brain has similarities with the latter. But the study of fossils has not confirmed this hypothesis. Another possible relationship has been suggested between snakes and Pygopodidae, lizards neighboring the geckos of the Australian region. They have very elongated bodies with no forelimbs and very reduced hind limbs. But this hypothesis has been disproved. It is now accepted that snakes are descended from lizards. Scientists are looking for their closest cousins among today's varanoids. One of the key questions that remains is how lizards came to give rise to snakes. Three hypotheses have been put forward, with snakes descending either from terrestrial lizards, aquatic lizards, or burrowing lizards. The first hypothesis is that of terrestrial origin. Very recently, a study published by Zhi Hang Li and his team in the journal Nature in 2022 and other earlier studies suggest that the terrestrial hypothesis is still considered likely as it is supported by the discovery of new fossils of primitive snakes that display terrestrial characteristics. Li's scientific paper describes a new fossil of a primitive snake Eophis C.F. Parvis, which was discovered in the Jiafotang Formation in China. This fossil has been dated to the Lower Cretaceous, around 125 million years ago. The second hypothesis of aquatic origin was put forward because Cretaceous mosasaurs, dolichosaurs, and agulosaurs 
were close relatives of the snake strain. These aquatic and even marine varanoids never underwent significant limb reduction. This hypothesis, although not the most supported, is not totally rejected, as fossils that appear closely related to snakes have been found in fossiliferous deposits of marine origin. The third and final hypothesis generally accepted is that of an origin from a burrowing form. It is based on the burrowing nature of primitive snakes, but also on the fact that burrowing lizards are often serpentiform. Work on the snake's retina has fueled this explanation. The cranium of snakes is reinforced. All mobility between its various regions and those of protruding elements, such as the temporal arches, is lost. These elements explain the passage through a burrowing phase, since burrowing lizards show the same modifications. Nevertheless, the connection of the upper jaw and palate bones to the skull is not compatible with burrowing activity. The consolidation of the skull may well be the legacy of a burrowing past. Mobility of the upper jaw and palate was only acquired later. The elongation of the body and the loss of limbs are adaptations linked to the burrowing lifestyle, but also to the frequentation of burrows and crevices housing the small mammals on which snakes' ancestors fed. These last two hypotheses suggest that snake ancestors were half aquatic and half burrowing, living in mud like some modern, apoded amphibians. The early stages of snake evolution are still poorly understood. The first complete fossil found is that of Pacorhacus. One meter long, it was serpentine, but also had reduced hind limbs. It is difficult to differentiate between a varanoid lizard with a very elongated body and a primitive snake. What all present-day snake species have in common is that they have limbless bodies capable of moving on the ground, in the air, and in the air throwing themselves from tree to tree. A Chinese charade fully describes the snake through a question. Who runs without legs, swims without fins, and glides without wings? But how did snakes come to lose their legs? The evolution of limbs is generally linked to a type of habitat. In birds, for example, their wings began to evolve as they moved through the air. In the case of snakes, two hypotheses are put forward. According to the first, snakes lost their legs when adapting to marine life, while the second hypothesis maintains that this loss was due to an adaptation to subterranean life. In fact, their streamlined shape makes them easier to move around underground. Lizards and snakes dig their tunnels simply by pushing the earth with their heads. Legs just get in the way. According to recent research, notably that of the inner ear of Denilicia, a type of primitive snake to which we'll return later, the most supported idea would be that the lineages that led to modern snakes lost their limbs when adapting to a subterranean life. This doesn't mean, however, that some Cretaceous lizards didn't one day decide to live underground and gradually lose their legs. Evolution is and always will be a random phenomenon. This new subterranean lifestyle reduced certain constraints on the genome of primitive snakes that were previously essential to their survival. Limbs and trunks were thus able to evolve, as demonstrated by the huge variety of fossilized snake types. The 
The spinal column of snakes generally comprises between 160 and 400 vertebrae, whereas that of humans has only 33, and that of lizards between 25 and 100. The formation of this highly characteristic anatomical element has been studied through the embryonic development of vertebrates, and in particular, the stages leading to the formation of the spinal column. The blocks of cells that each give rise to a vertebra are called somites. It is from these that the head and trunk of membranous vertebrates are formed. At some point, these embryonic structures differentiate to form the various regions of the vertebral column, from the neck to the tail. In snakes, there is a gene specially named lunatic fringe, which is involved in the multiplication of vertebrae. Combined with other genes responsible for somite formation, the lunatic fringe will cluster cells at the caudal end of the embryo. Once a certain number of cells have been brought together, a somite is formed and moves up the body. The set of genes responsible for somite formation represents the molecular clock of somitogenesis. They regularly switch on and off to form somites. If this clock is ticking fast, more somites are produced from the same number of initial cells. And vertebrae aren't the only bones in the body to undergo atypical development in snakes. With the exception of the three vertebrae closest to the head and the tail vertebrae, all snakes have ribs. The ribs do not meet along the belly, so they can spread apart when the snake swallows a large prey. This homogeneous spine is thought to be the result of the transformation of the ancestral trunk configuration of ancient legged animals, perhaps even a specialization linked to the loss of legs. During the course of their evolution, snakes perfected several modes of a potus locomotion i.e. limbless movement, as well as their prey-gripping system. Their evolutionary success is indisputable. Vestiges of pelvic girdles and hind limbs can be seen in the most primitive of today's snakes, such as boas and pythons. These form small projections on either side of the cloaca, but are not used for locomotion. Snakes have adapted their locomotion to a wide variety of environments, which has contributed to their expansion. New joints between the vertebrae have appeared, and the intercostal and skin muscles have become specialized. The mouth, and more specifically the jaws, evolved in two different directions from a primitive stage. Scolosophids, with their small mouths, capture and ingest small prey. Alephinophids, which account for 90% of today's species, have large mouths, enabling them to ingest prey up to a size larger than their own. Because of their small size, Scolosophids fossilize very poorly, and scientists have little data on their past history. Alephinophids, on the other hand, are more easily visible. This adaptation modified the jaw skeleton, as well as the supratemporal and square bones, which are arranged differently in snakes. Alephinophids, which eat large prey, have developed an innovative mechanism not found in lizards and scolosophids. A joint between the snout and the rest of the skull allows the mouth to be enlarged to the maximum. This enables them to swallow larger prey in one go.
The evolution of lizards and the appearance of the first primitive snakes began during the Mesozoic era. This era is divided into three periods, the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. We are in the Triassic, just after the Great Permian extinction. The planet is empty. Some 90% of all life forms, both terrestrial and marine, have disappeared forever as a result of the catastrophe that caused the mass extinction. It was against this backdrop that the Triassic period began. The Earth stretches out like a vast virgin surface, waiting to be conquered. During the previous era, all the continents subjected to tectonic forces had coalesced into a supercontinent called Pangaea. Pangaea is surrounded by a vast ocean called Panthalassa, which contains all the seas. At the center of Pangaea lies a totally isolated paleo-ocean called Thetis. Pangaea is generally warm. No ice caps are in place to cool the planet. The coast is humidified by the ocean, while the interior remains dry. The Hercynian mountain range formed by the collision of Laurasia and Proto-Gondwana influences the climate of the supercontinent. The height of the mountains blocks clouds and causes precipitation. As a result, the climate on either side of the Hercynian chain is very different. It can be hot and humid due to cloud-driven rainfall or hot and dry since no clouds reach that side of the range, resulting in no precipitation at all. Fauna and flora thrive best on the northern slopes of the Hercynian chain. Rainfall is conducive to the development of vegetation, which in turn attracts animals. Mosses, gymnosperms, seed-bearing plants, Ferns and lycopods are timidly covering the planet, despite the catastrophe of the Permian extinction. Within a few million years, vegetation flourished again on Pangaea. As for the fauna, many ecological niches were left vacant following the Permian extinction. The few surviving species will conquer them. Animals had to evolve and diversify to adapt to this new environment. New species appear. In the oceans, life returns to normal. Within a few thousand years, life was once again abundant. Marine reptiles take off. All this marine fauna remains essentially coastal. Only when Pangaea had fragmented would it colonize the open sea. On land, the survivors spread. At the top of the food chain are archosauromorph reptiles. Some of these gave rise to the archosaurs, followed by the first pterosaurs, insect-eating flying reptiles. The archosaur line also produced the first crocodiliforms, which gave rise to the future crocodilians and then the first dinosaurs. During the Triassic period, dinosaurs were not yet the giants we know today. One of the largest and most widespread Triassic dinosaurs is Platyosaurus. The largest specimens are around 10 meters long. Mammals are represented by therapsids and dicynodonts but they gradually declined as the cynodont branch developed. From the therapsid branch emerged the first mammalia forms, very close relatives of mammals. These appeared at the end of the Triassic, but diversified during the Jurassic. A small discrete animal remains alongside all these animals Megachirella, Watchtlery, 
the only species of squamate terrestrial reptile in the Megachirilla genus. It measures around 15 centimeters or 6 inches, has a rather robust broad skull, a slightly elongated neck, and long sturdy front legs. Its general morphology is similar to that of today's lizards. This terrestrial animal may well be the ancestor of the squamates we know today. But if it is to survive, it will have to demonstrate great resistance and adaptability to the events that lie ahead. The Triassic saw the beginning of the breakup of Pangaea, which continued throughout the Mesozoic era. A fault appeared at the foot of the Hercynian chain, fragmenting the continent. The waters of the Fetus Ocean, which until then had been contained within the heart of Pangaea, rushed into this fault, opening up a vast passage of water that would later become known as the North Atlantic Ocean. Pangaea split, giving rise to Laurasia and Gondwana. The Thetis Ocean is now much larger than it was before. Its warm, sun-drenched waters and shallow depths became a veritable paradise for marine life. Following the fragmentation of Pangaea, volcanism became frequent, releasing large quantities of methane and carbon dioxide. Global warming followed, triggering a new planetary crisis. 80% of marine and terrestrial species combined disappeared. The Jurassic period opens on an unhappy Earth, depopulated of many species. On land and in the oceans, it was a veritable hecatomb. Nevertheless, the climate remained stable, allowing marine and terrestrial flora and fauna to thrive. And as in all mass extinction tragedies, the ecological niches left vacant will soon be occupied by newcomers. Since the division of Pangaea, the climate has become warm and humid, and vegetation has developed abundantly. Lush green expanses cover a large part of the continents. This vegetation benefits herbivorous animals enormously. They grow, diversify, and become very numerous. As their appetite increases, so does their size. The Jurassic is known as the golden age of the great sauropod dinosaurs. The famous Diplodocus, the Brachiosaurus, and the extraordinary Stegosaurus populate the Earth's surface. The Brachiosaurus is a quadrupedal dinosaur with longer limbs at the front than at the back. Its femur alone is larger than a man's, measuring over 2 meters or 7 feet. Its immensely long neck is made up of a dozen vertebrae, each measuring up to 70 centimeters or 28 inches. It is particularly well suited to grazing on the leaves of tall plants. Its head can tower 13 meters, or 43 feet, above the ground, and its mass is around 20 tons. Brachiosaurus has crenulated teeth, whose flattened shape is particularly well suited to crushing plants. Brachiosaurs are social animals, living in herds. These enormous herbivores gathered in the same place are not without displeasing carnivorous predators. While these predators were modest in size in the Triassic, they reached extraordinary dimensions in the Jurassic. The Allosaurus, a carnivorous theropod, could measure up to 12 meters or 40 feet from head to tail and up to 4 meters or 13 feet in height. The name Allosaurus literally means strange lizard due to the bumps on its skull. 
Thanks to its powerful muscles, it can run at speeds of between 30 and 55 kilometers per hour, 34 miles per hour. Its robust limbs are clearly adapted to hunting. It has very powerful claws, and the structure of its tail enables it to maintain balance in relation to its total body weight. Although it can't open its mouth wide, a muscle at the back of its skull gives it the strength to sink its teeth into its prey. The Allosaurus is a formidable predator. A new fauna now colonizes the air. Until now, only flying insects have roamed the skies. Now, many reptiles have joined them and are discovering the advantages of this precious food source. Dimorphodon and Rampharonychus are true flying predators. Dimorphodon is a flying animal with an average length of 1 meter and a wingspan of 1.45 meters or 5 feet. Its body structure is fairly primitive, with a very small skull and short wings. The first phalanx of its wing finger is only slightly longer than its lower arm. Its neck, though small, is very flexible. Its wings, proportionately short in relation to its body, make it a poor flyer. As a result, it flies for short periods, as it is unable to travel long distances. A discreet little animal, it takes advantage of the abundance of vegetation. He's trying to make his way through all the clutter. It's Parviraptor, a genus of snake comprising just one species, Parviraptor estesi. 15 centimeters or 6 inches long, it has vestigial limbs showing that it was still in a transitional phase between lizards and snakes. In the seas, marine reptiles which had appeared in the previous period reign supreme. They include ichthyosaurs, Plesiosaurs and Pliosaurs. Plesiosaurs are large aquatic reptiles. Their long necks and four fins enabled them to paddle in oceans, lakes, rivers, and swamps during the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods. The term Plesiosaur also includes Pliosaurs. Their bodies are more hydrodynamic, with larger heads and shorter necks. The largest pliosaurs, such as Liopleurodon, are as fearsome as the great white shark. Thanks to its gustatory and visual senses, Liopleurodon locates its prey by swimming with its mouth open. Liopleurodon are well adapted to their environment. Its legs enable it to move swiftly through the water at great depths. Its front flippers push the water backwards, enabling it to propel itself. Plesiosaurs and pliosaurs, although they have marine lifestyles, are primarily lizards and must regularly come to the surface to breathe. Pliosaurs were at the top of the food chain at first only to be supplanted by mosasaurs a little later. Ichthyosaurs are diapsid marine reptiles. They lived in the Triassic and Jurassic periods and disappeared at the beginning of the Cretaceous. They are relatively modest in size, except for some specimens such as Shonosaurus, which reached up to 35 meters or 115 feet in length. Their powerful fins enable them to travel at speeds of up to 40 kilometers per hour 
or 25 miles per hour. They feed on fish, ammonites, and belemnites, thanks to a long snout with sharp teeth. They have the morphology of today's dolphins and behave like them in that they can descend to great depths and leap back to the surface. Ichthyosaurs give birth to live, ready-to-swim young, rather than eggs, which is an advantage for their survival. Alongside these marine reptiles, cartilaginous fish developed, taking on the morphology of today's sharks. Crocodilians also evolved from archosaurs, just like dinosaurs. Several lineages of dinosaurs appeared during the Jurassic, surviving for the next 150 million years. The most important development was the appearance of the first birds. The Jurassic ended, and a new chapter in Earth's history began, the Cretaceous, during which snakes really developed and diversified In the Cretaceous, Pangaea is now divided into Laurasia to the north and Gondwana to the south. Laurasia also split into two parts. The North Atlantic Ocean appears, and the southeastern part is about to open up. Seen from the sky, the Earth begins to look somewhat familiar. The Earth still has no ice caps. The climate is generally warm. Sea levels are about 200 meters or 660 feet higher than they are today. Flora and fauna continue to evolve. Dinosaurs are the dominant animal group with the largest body sizes. They diversify and new groups appear, while others become extinct. Among them, the Tyrannosaurus appeared at the very end of the period. More commonly known as the T-Rex, this giant of 4 meters or 13 feet in height and 12 meters or 40 feet in length could weigh up to 7 tons. This bipedal super predator was at the top of the food chain, feeding on large herbivores. That's not going to stop the snakes from getting bigger and bigger in this environment that's so favorable to them. Flowering plants, the angiosperms, make their appearance. Alongside ferns and conifers, they will become dominant by the end of the period, thanks to insects. The vegetation is very welcoming to snakes, whose evolution is already underway at this time. Their bodies are already long and sinuous. Most still have reduced limbs, like Najash Rhianagrina, but some have already lost them, like Denalysia patagonica. Snakes now come in a multitude of forms, exploiting a variety of ecological niches. This evolution will also enable them to reach larger sizes, Denalysia patagonica is the first known legless snake. It rubbed shoulders with the great dinosaurs that dominated the world at the time. It has no limbs, no shoulder girdle, and no pelvic girdle. This relatively large predator reaches up to 2 meters or 7 feet in length. The shape of its skull is reminiscent of that of the Boidae and suggests that it was capable of consuming large prey. Dinalysia patagonica lives in desert environments. It is a terrestrial animal. This snake is closely related to the original ancestor of the crown snake clade. Extensive study of its inner ear has demonstrated that it is equipped to dig burrows and receive low-frequency ground vibrations to detect predators and capture prey. Consequently, it is not equipped for aquatic life.
There are significant differences between the vestibules of terrestrial burrowing specialists, those of non-burrowing terrestrial generalists, and those of aquatic forms. The vestibule of marine snakes and lizards has shrunk to almost nothing. In burrowing species, on the other hand, the vestibule is inflated like a balloon to improve hearing performance in subterranean environments. This trend is confirmed in all burrowers. The vestibule of Denalicia patagonica is large and has the same balloon-like shape as those of today's burrowing snakes. It is almost identical to that of Xenopeltis, a type of burrowing snake from Southeast Asia that feeds on small rodents and other small snakes. Like Xenopeltis, Denalicia patagonica hunts on the surface and burrows into soft ground for shelter. It is a carnivorous snake, feeding mainly on animal prey. Its extensible jaws and teeth are designed for grasping and ingesting animal prey. Because it lacks limbs, Dinalicia patagonica crawls and gains access to burrows and shelters of small vertebrates, such as other reptiles, small mammals, birds, and even fish. Its relatively large size enables it to hunt large prey. Dinalicia patagonica is a genus of primitive snakes closely related to the ancestor of today's snakes. It is not one of the first lineages to separate from the lizards, like Najash rhianagrina. Like many Cretaceous snakes, Najash rhianagrina has small bony hind limbs extending from the hip to the ankle. It moves easily on land thanks to its two legs, which also serve to hold on to its partner during mating. This snake has characteristics that our modern snakes no longer possess. The bone below the orbit has the same shape, position, and connections as the jugal bone of most lizards. This lower part of the jugal bone was therefore lost over the course of snake evolution to form a rod-shaped bone. The morphology of Najash rhianagrina bears a familiar resemblance to that of modern-day lizard species, such as the Komodo dragon. It has a massive mouth, head, and body. But other representatives of the lizard-snake transition also roam the Earth in the Cretaceous. Coniophis precedens is one of the oldest known fossil snakes. It lived 65 to 70 million years ago. It is one of the few fossils to represent the transition from snakes to their lizard cousins. Coniophis precedens lives in a floodplain environment and lacks adaptations for aquatic locomotion. This discovery suggests that creeping reptiles are terrestrial rather than aquatic in origin. It is small in stature, small in legs, and has a spine that reveals burrowing characteristics. Its jaws are more rigid and articulated than those of its modern cousins, but should already have enabled it to swallow large prey. It was at the end of the Cretaceous period that the Boidae appeared, dominating the world of snakes, especially in Europe and North America. Some of them reached record sizes for snakes. The Matsoidae are a family of giant snakes that can measure over 10 meters or 33 feet. Matsoid snakes are constrictors that resemble modern pythons and boas. Their jaw structure, however, is more primitive and much less suited to swallowing large prey. 
Members of this family have specific characteristics, such as the presence of a pituitary gland in the anterior part of the trunk, or the fact that the middle and posterior vertebrae of the trunk have a moderately or well-developed hemal keel. Among the Matsoidae, during the Cretaceous period, we find the genus Matsoia. It is represented by several species, the largest of which measures 10 meters or 33 feet in length. It's not just on Earth that snakes reach giant sizes. Another family related to the Boidae, the Paleophidae, represented by Paleophis, also reaches lengths of around 10 meters. These are all aquatic snakes that populate the Eocene seas. The smallest specimens of this family measured around 1 meter in length. Studies of Paleophis vertebrae reveal a high degree of vascularization. This suggests that the specimens had a much faster metabolism and growth rate than modern snakes. Eupidophis is a genus of marine snake that lived around 90 million years ago. It is rather modest in size, measuring 85 centimeters or 34 inches long, but has two small legs at the back, making it a transitional specimen between lizards and limbless snakes. The known species is called Eupidophis discoensi. Its body ends in a short paddle-shaped tail. Its vertebrae and ribs are thickened as a result of its aquatic lifestyle. The pelvic bones are small and weakly attached to each other. Eupidophis discoensi has hind limbs that, although small, are anatomically comparable to those of modern land lizards. These marine snakes share the aquatic environment with other marine reptiles. While the ichthyosaurs are becoming extinct, as yet unexplained, a new group is emerging, the mosasaurids. The mosasaur was a marine reptile that dominated the oceans at the end of the Cretaceous. With its crocodile-like appearance, it boasts heavy oval jaws. It can reach lengths of around 15 meters or 50 feet. Despite its large eyes, it has poor vision and olfactory senses. It has sharp teeth that enable it to cut up its prey so that it can eat it more easily, since its slender jaw means it can't swallow it all at once. Its scales are smooth and dark, and it has a fin at the end of its tail. In the air, species get bigger and bigger and are inexorably outcompeted by the first birds. Even on land, the race for gigantism is still on and snakes, though massive, must be wary of new predators in the air. The skies are now dominated by animals with wingspans of up to 15 meters or 50 feet. Such as the Quetzalcoatlus. Quetzalcoatlus cohabitated with dinosaurs and is the largest flying creature ever to have existed. Its name literally means feathered serpent. This type of flying reptile belongs to the pterosaur group. Because of its size, it can be compared to a giraffe when on the ground. It averages 11 meters or 36 feet in length and weighs up to 200 kilograms or 440 pounds. The Quetzalcoatlus has two very pronounced pointed wings, giving it speed when it flies. Another advantage is that its weight is relatively low compared with its size, 
making it easier to climb into the sky, despite its gigantic size. It has a long neck made up of numerous vertebrae, all interlocking with the folds of its wings. Its beak is slender, straight and elongated. Because of its size, it is probably capable of hunting large prey, such as large fish, reptiles, birds, and perhaps even small dinosaurs or dead animal carcasses. Its long jaw and conical teeth suggest that it could catch and swallow whole prey in flight or on the ground. The Cretaceous period came to an end with the fifth and last of the mass extinctions. The theory most widely accepted by scientists is that of a meteorite impact preceding major volcanic eruptions at the trap, Dudecan, in present-day India. A celestial body from outer space crashed to Earth. Its diameter, estimated at around 10 kilometers, combined with the speed of the impact, caused an immeasurable explosion. Everything was vaporized for hundreds of kilometers at the very second of impact. Neither flora nor fauna were spared. Debris was propelled into the atmosphere and fell back to Earth, sparking numerous fires. The dust and gases emitted combined with water to produce acid rain, devastating everything it touches. In the seas, the plankton that form the basis of the food chain are wiped out. Dust in the atmosphere blocks out sunlight, plunging the earth into a permanent night. As a result, temperatures plummet. Survivors are small animals with less need for food. The animals try to adapt as best they can to the new environment created by the catastrophe. Temperatures drop. Reptiles, which are cold-blooded animals, prolong their fasting and manage to survive. Other small omnivorous animals managed to adapt to the catastrophe and underwent a major evolutionary radiation mammals. A new era began, the Paleogene, when the Cretaceous tertiary extinction had wiped out the species that had previously dominated the planet. A new age begins, the age of mammals, but not only. The surviving fauna will spread and diversify. Mammals that had hitherto lived in the shadow of the dinosaurs will become the planet's dominant group. The non-avian dinosaurs have all disappeared. Avian dinosaurs will continue to evolve and become the birds we know today. Flying reptiles and marine reptiles are no more. In the oceans, the situation is catastrophic. The majority of large predators have not survived, and fish will be able to take advantage of the ecological niches left vacant. The great reptiles have disappeared, but at the same time, other animals have managed to survive. Turtles, lizard, snake, and crocodiles continue to evolve more serenely. How did snakes survive? The strength of snakes in this apocalyptic environment is their ability to survive without food for periods of up to a full year. At the same time, most species in the food chain are disappearing. Snakes are adept at hunting in the dark, which came in handy when the earth was hit by a long cold winter as the sun was no longer able to penetrate the atmosphere. Snakes living underground in the forest or in water are the ones that fare best. Once the environment calms down, snakes emerge from their shelters and to their great delight have far fewer adversaries to contend with. 
they survive and spread all over the world. The impact of the meteorite had consequences for the climate. The clouds of ash and particles that spread through the atmosphere on impact are said to have spread across the entire planet, enveloping parts of the Earth in total darkness for over 700 days. Temperatures dropped considerably for several decades, from an average of 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit before the impact to 3 degrees Celsius or 37 degrees Fahrenheit in the years that followed. Then, over the next thousand years, the climate becomes tropical again. Temperatures rise again. The Earth now has many land masses. North America and Africa gradually saw their inland seas shrink. Shoals emerge and continental surfaces expand. India moves northwards, breaking away from Madagascar. Australia breaks away from Antarctica. Flowering plants cover continental surfaces. Tall trees such as redwoods now grow to form lush forests. This vegetation is a veritable paradise for animals. It offers shelter and food. In the oceans, the great marine reptiles are no more, and the cartilaginous fish, known as chondrichthians, to which sharks belong, become true predators over the following millions of years. The actinopterygian, ray-finned fish multiplied to become the most numerous. During the Paleocene and Eocene, the Earth underwent a widespread warming episode. Surface water temperatures approached 23 degrees Celsius or 73 degrees Fahrenheit at low latitudes and 17 degrees Celsius or 63 degrees Fahrenheit near Antarctica. In addition to this generalized warming, a crisis occurred during the transition from the Paleocene to the Eocene, 56 million years ago. A hyperthermal episode occurred, known as the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. This event could be explained by a strong release of methane into the atmosphere, caused by the thermal destabilization of methane hydrates present in marine sediments. The temperature of the deep ocean rose by 4 to 6 degrees Celsius, an increase of 11 degrees Fahrenheit. The Arctic zone reaches temperatures in excess of 20 degrees Celsius, or 68 degrees Fahrenheit, to the extent that tropical species of phytoplankton thrive there. The Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum caused a major disruption of the carbon cycle. A biological crisis ensued, leading to the extinction of 30 to 50 percent of the microorganisms living on the ocean floor. However, other organisms also benefited. As temperatures rise, the environment changes completely. Pollen fossils of ferns and palms were discovered during drilling at a depth of one kilometer in Antarctica, along with fossils of crocodile ancestors. Fossils corresponding to a mangrove forest also remain at today's North Pole. The main orders of modern mammals appear at this time, but it was the cold-blooded reptiles that most benefited from this warming. Snakes need high temperatures to remain active. Average temperatures of between 30 and 34 degrees Celsius, or 86 degrees Fahrenheit, combined with the humid tropical environment, have enabled some snakes to reach extraordinary dimensions. 
Although they were already reaching impressive sizes by the end of the Cretaceous, the absence of oversized dinosaurs allowed them to continue to develop and grow even larger. One of the most famous genera of giant snakes from this period is Titanoboa. Its name literally translates as Titanic Boa. The only known species today is Titanoboa serogenensis. Titanoboa belongs to the Boidae family, which consists of carnivorous snake builders found mainly in tropical zones. These include boas and anacondas, Titanoboa, Serogenensis was discovered in 2002 when scientists on an expedition to the Serajon coal mines in La Gajira, Colombia, discovered immense thoracic vertebrae and ribs. Other fossils were subsequently unearthed for a total of 186 fossils representing 30 individuals. Research continued for two years and other giant reptile fossils from turtles and crocodilians were also found. All date from the Paleocene epoch, around 60 million years ago, just after the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction. The excavated fossils are being transported to the Florida Museum of Natural History for study by a team of international scientists the vertebrae and ribs discovered belong to a new giant boadian named Titanoboa serogenensis. In 2011, a second expedition will be carried out in the same region to further investigate Titanoboa. Three disarticulated skulls and parts of the mandible associated with the partial axial skeletons were discovered. Titanoboa is one of the few known fossil snakes with cranial material in good condition. True colossuses roamed the earth as giant snakes millions of years ago. But what did these giant creatures look like? And in what context did these snakes evolve? How did they evolve to such massive proportions? Titanoboa is the largest known snake in the fossil record. In Boyd's, the increase in body size is due to larger vertebrae rather than an increase in the number of bones making up the skeleton. Titanoboa reaches a height of just over 14 meters or 46 feet, with a diameter of 80 centimeters or 31 inches. It weighed around 1,500 kilograms or 3,300 pounds, four times heavier than today's largest snake. Its skull measures 40 centimeters or 16 inches, and a modern man could stand upright in its open mouth. Titanoboa far exceeds the largest snakes on Earth today, from the green anaconda to the reticulated python and even Gigantophis. Several specimens of this colossal size have been found, confirming that Titanoboa regularly reaches these gigantic proportions. Snakes, whether Paleocene or modern day, are poiclotherms. They have no control over their body temperature, which varies according to the temperature of their environment. This lack of control over internal temperature prevent snakes from being active during cold periods, as they conserve energy. Their size is limited and influenced by the outside temperature. When the temperature is too low, the animal has a slow metabolism that cannot support a body that is too large. During the Paleocene, in Colombia, where Titanoboa fossils were found, the temperature reached between 30 
and 34 degrees Celsius, or 93 degrees Fahrenheit. Titanoboa is so enormous that it cannot support its own weight on land. It is an aquatic animal. It lives close to fast-flowing rivers, where freshwater turtles and crocodiles make up a large part of its diet. It thrives in the equatorial rainforest, where it can find plenty of food. One of Titanoboa's famous meals is Sarajonesuchus. This cousin of the crocodile is one of the giant snake's favorite prey. Its fossil has also been found in the Sarahone Formation in Colombia, where Titanoboa's remains were found. Unlike Titanoboa, Sarajonesuchus is a small specimen. It is a crocodiliform that belongs to the group of modern-day crocodilians. Like Titanoboa, it thrives in a neotropical equatorial forest environment. While the evolution of reptiles tends toward gigantism, this one sticks to a rather reduced size. What's more, unlike its crocodile cousins with their long claw-like snouts, specialized in catching prey, Sarajonosuchus has a short, broad snout. Its diet consists mainly of amphibians, small reptiles, and mammals. Some scientists believe it is adapted by tapping into food sources that don't attract the other giant species it comes into contact with. Sarajonosuchus is easy prey because of its small size, and it must also beware of carbonemies. This giant freshwater turtle measures around 2.5 meters or 8 feet in length, including 1.8 meters or 6 feet for its carapace alone. Carbonemies has an omnivorous diet. Its strong jaws and imposing size enable it to attack medium-sized crocodiles. While Titanoboa made its home in the part of the world that corresponds to present-day Colombia, giant snakes of the Madsoidae family remain on other continents. Gicantophus gestini is similar to a giant anaconda. This snake grows to over 10 meters or 33 feet, and possesses considerable strength. Until the discovery of Titanoboa, Gicantophus gestini was considered the largest snake ever to have existed on Earth. Its shape and vertebrae are primitive. It lives near waterways and in areas of lush vegetation. It feeds on small mammals, but its size also enables it to attack large animals such as the ancestors of elephants, the Moritherium. Although it looks rather like today's tappers, the Moritherium is a mammal that belongs to the elephant group, as it shares many common anatomical features. The Moritherium measures around 3 meters or 10 feet in length, and weighs around 400 kilograms or 880 pounds. It is smaller than today's elephants and occupies ecological niches currently taken by the hippopotamus, such as swamps and rivers. Moritherium feeds on vegetation. It does not have a trunk, comparable to that of the elephant, but instead has a wide, flexible upper lip, enabling it to grasp hard-to-reach vegetation. Wanambi is a genus of large snake that lived in Australia during the Pleistocene. It measures between 5 and 6 meters, or 20 feet long, and has a small head. It stays close to water holes to catch its prey by surprise when it comes to drink. It then kills them by construction, which means it wraps itself around its prey and suffocates them to death. 
Alongside him, Yarlunger also lives in Australia. This large predator used to grow up to 6 meters in length. It operates much like its sidekick, Wanambi, standing close to water holes to attack its prey and killing them by construction. Other giants live alongside Wanambi and Yarlunger. Megalania prissa is a giant monitor that lives in Australia. It thrives in warm, dry areas, grasslands, savannas, and lowland rainforests. Its dimensions are impressive. It reaches lengths of 5 to 7 meters, or 23 feet, and weighs over a ton. It is one of the super predators of our time. Its morphology is reminiscent of today's Komodo dragon, only more massive. It wears a dark green, gray, or black color to remain inconspicuous in its environment and discreetly approach its prey. Its skin is reinforced with plates of small bones, called osteoderms, forming a kind of chain mail. Its name has a Greek meaning, meaning gigantic wanderer. Thanks to its large size, it is not afraid to attack equally oversized prey. It has a long tail, which it can use in its attacks. Its many teeth and long curved claws at the end of its legs make it a formidable opponent. Giant snakes, as they appeared in earlier eras, no longer exist in our modern world. The circumstances of their disappearance remain a mystery. But what we do know is that while they may have some major advantages, their main weakness is their dependence on the climate. These creatures are dependent on the liquid element, ambient humidity, and high temperatures prevailing on Earth at the time. As soon as cooling and drying affect their environment, these giants are condemned to extinction. This extreme dependence on their environment and their low adaptive flexibility compared to other species proved fatal. However, the snake suborder has not disappeared altogether. They are just smaller in size even if a few specimens stand out for their length or weight, they don't surpass our famous Titanoboa. In today's world, three snakes stand out for their above average length and weight. The reticulated python is a snake that lives in Southeast Asia. It is not only the world's largest snake, but also the longest land animal. It can reach up to 10 meters or 33 feet and weigh up to 140 kilograms or 310 pounds. It thrives in tropical rainforests and swamps. The reticulated python is an excellent swimmer that also enjoys aquatic areas. It is capable of eating large animals such as monkeys or wild pigs, but is also content with small mammals such as rabbits or rats or birds. Just behind the reticulated python on the podium of longest snakes comes the green anaconda at 8.5 meters or 28 feet in length. Despite its second place, it has nothing to envy the reticulated python, since it surpasses it in weight and can reach up to 200 kilograms or 440 pounds. Female specimens are heavier than males. The green anaconda is a constrictor snake with a predominantly aquatic lifestyle. It can remain in the water for 10 to 20 minutes without breathing, it hunts at night, leaving only its eyes and nostrils above the surface of the water. It thrives in the Amazon rainforest, 
climbing from tree to tree as the need arises. It is capable of swallowing large mammals, such as tappers and goats. The Saba python is Africa's largest snake. It reaches up to 7.5 meters or 25 feet in length and weighs around 100 kilograms or 220 pounds. It thrives in rocky areas and savannas, but also in aquatic environments. Like the reticulated python and the green anaconda, it feeds on both small and large mammals it may even prey on hyenas or small crocodiles. Life on Earth never ceases to reinvent itself, to invent new scenarios and to surprise us. When a specimen is affected by gigantism and reaches abnormally large dimensions compared to its congeners or close relatives, on the evolutionary tree, man always tries to understand why. Discoveries of giant snakes, like Titanoboa, are having a significant impact on research, contributing to our understanding of Earth's history. They provide valuable information about past biodiversity and demonstrate the astonishing plurality of life forms that may have existed in previous geological eras. These discoveries have provided even more information for the study of the evolution of these singular animals, leading to a global understanding of the origin and evolution of modern snakes. What's more, the discovery of fossils is always an invaluable source of data, providing new insights into the environmental conditions of the time Scientists now know more about the food chains of the past, including these giant snakes as major predators in their ecosystems. Their existence strongly influenced the populations of other species that lived in the same regions as them. Giant snakes are still a source of fascination today. Their legacy is present in popular culture and their study is important in understanding the history of the Earth. They play a fascinating role in myths and legends. Generally speaking, the morphological and biological characteristics of snakes give them a supernatural character. Even though they have no limbs, they are able to move quickly. They can be found on land, in trees, or in water. They can emerge at any time from underground hiding places. They swallow their prey in a single gulp and can inflict venomous bites. Snakes are very different from humans and other animals, so it's only natural that humans should classify them as strange and supernatural creatures. Would this not also be a reminder of nature's ability to fashion creatures as remarkable as they are mysterious?